Hey everybody, I'm Yvonne with Back to Earth Creations and in this video we're going to do a little bit of a master class on Half Persian 3-in-1, but we're going to go really in depth on how to put it together, though I wouldn't recommend this for your first time weaving Half Persian 3-in-1, it's just if you want to take it to the next level, because I'm also going to show you how to do connection points and to bring it together into a complete necklace which I think is a very pretty, or if you're inclined to putting things on your noggin, a nice circlet, which I love. I love circlets. I am a ham and cheese sandwich for some circlets. I don't even know what that means, but it gets me so excited that words stop making sense. So <laughs> let's go ahead and get the camera flipped around and get to crafting. The first thing that I'd like for us to go over for this project is how to make a half Persian 3-in-1 chainmail bezel. Here I am using 20 gauge 1 8 inch stainless steel jump rings that my husband has set up for me in units that, that's what we call them. It is one open ring with one closed ring put on each and we'll go over the opening and closing here but I am going to say I would not necessarily recommend this as a beginner chainmail um, project because these small rings can be pretty tricky. There will be links down in the video description and quite possibly up here on the screen to take you to the tutorial that I do recommend if it's your first time weaving half Persian 3-in-1 and trying to get the ends joined because y'all, this is a notoriously tricky weave or it can be. Some folks pick it up easy. A lot of folks email me with questions and stuff. And if you would like to, you can take a picture of your work if you're having difficulty just sit it on your work surface, take a picture of it with your cell phone, and then send it to me in an email, and I will try my best to be helpful to you. Like, I can circle where it's like this ring right here or, you know, something. But if you're very new to this, I'd recommend doing two, two different metal tones. Maybe very helpful. So maybe like some stainless steel and some brass. Um, but again, it's a good idea to already be familiar with weaving half Persian three in one. That being said, let's go ahead and get into it. Now with the stones that we're using, these are actually fused glass, or fused dichroic glass cabochons that uh, we make in our home kiln. We do have cabs like these up for sale on our website, backtoearthcreations.com. But you could use whatever size and shape of stone or bead or bobble or capuchon. For a long time, we actually made these with straight up dollar store fish tank glass and they were still really pretty. And we would paint the backs with like nail polish. Um, and it was just, it was pretty nice, uh, totally worked. But something that can be tricky and I'm gonna show is this is the setting, the bezel that we have made for this one is 19 rings long. Now, since the cabochons that I'm using are not calibrated, this one right here is a little, it's just not holding on to it tight. So we're going to do that one 18 rings long. So I know that I tend to ramble, but there's a lot of information that I'm trying to cram in here so that I'm not having to send you off to watch like 20 other tutorials. Um, so I keep mine, this is just in a crystal light container. I like the lids, they hold up really well. Like this is like a 10 year old container. So... We're going to start with opening and closing the rings just as a refresher, just in case you're feeling bold and do want to try this as your first project. So you can see how the ring, just out of the bag from the manufacturer, I got these from the ringlord.com, links to everything down below in the video description. You can see it's a little offset right there. So we're going to still need to close it. So to do that, I like to take, just holding on, two points on the, uh, ring holding with my pliers and I'm just wiggling and I'm kind of pressing my pliers together but we want to get a really nice butted edge you can smush it with your pliers a bit sometimes there'll be a little burr you can see there's a little burr of metal from where it got cut and you may be able to burnish that down with the tip of your pliers and by burnish that's just kind of rubbing it in um, it's not quite sanding, it's just rubbing it down. And so for our first ring, 
in our weave. We're going to do two closed on one open. And then to open our rings, you want to take it from that same and we're just going to open that way. I'm right-handed, so I open to where this end, the left side of the ring. Whenever I'm weaving, I can insert it. So that's why I'm doing that. If I were left-handed, I may prefer to weave with it bent this way. That way I can insert it into the weave. It's like a I don't know, hopefully this will make more sense as we get there. Whichever way you do it, just do it consistently. But if you're weaving along with me, um, that's how I'm opening them. And I'm just going to set that one off to the side. So we have our, whoop, and both of them, both of those closed rings just popped right off. And again, it is a little trickier in these smaller ring sizes. So I'm just hooking two closed onto the one open. And we're going to close that. Get as good of a closure as you can. And now I'm going to move my rings so that they're like this. I'm holding it between my thumbnail and the pad of my finger. And I just want them kind of lined up like that because I'm going to take this one here on the right and I'm going to tuck it just a little behind the ring on the left. Not like that but like that. And again, it's some folks may weave it this way. I'm just teaching what I do and this is how I do it. And so now we're going to pick up and this is the trickiest step you guys. And you can see how I mean where it's by having that ring opened to around a 45 degree angle to leave enough of an opening that I can hold with my pliers and then stitch through. I'm trying to stitch right through this little Venn diagram, just catching the front two rings. I'm not going through this back ring here at all. So I'm just hooking through and then I'm going to close it. And at this stage, I try really hard to not set the project down because I want to just close that and then grab those first two rings again <sighs> that way. Cause if I drop it, it's just a jumble y'all. And so now I'm going to want to put this ring, this little guy that was hanging loose right there, behind the other one. That way they can be stacked on each other. It's very similar to like how when dominoes fall, you want when like they'd all look kind of stacked, you know, because they ch -ch 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 fell over. I want this to be in a stack, but oh, it's going to be tricky to get that ring over there. So what I do is I'm actually lifting, coming around the top of that one and then nestling in behind. So see how they're stacked now? And then we're gonna do that over and over and over again. So it can be helpful. I like to hold directly underneath where I'm gonna be hooking the new ring in. Sometimes I'll hook through just one and then I'll lift this back ring and encourage it over as well. And then we're going to close it and we're going to pick that up and then we're going to do that same thing. And I'm going to show you from the side, I'm lifting this ring up and over. It's just to make space so I can get it. There we go. Behind. Do not recommend. I do not recommend doing this as your very, like I used rings a little bit smaller than this one uh, on my very first because I was doing a whole bunch of little um, tiger's eye cabochons setting them in like 22 gauge like just just <sighs> shaved good years off my life but every project ever since then has been easier <laughs> than that project but that's the one that I was learning how to close half Persian 3 and one on so I guess pick your pick your torture <laughs> so but you can do it you can do it I promise practice will make progress so we're just getting it lined up, hooking through one and two. Again, just through that little Venn diagram. And then we're going to close it. But yeah, using larger rings, a larger stone, um, that would be better for a first project. But 
I wanted to do this tutorial as a way of taking our half Persian 3-in-1 bezels to the next level um, for being able to just incorporate them together in a piece instead of just having a standalone because this makes a beautiful pendant or a beautiful uh, ring you could use like um well, we've done that in a live stream, but I can't think of how long ago that was. But I use UV resin when I'm set in the backs um, to just set like a stainless steel ring, you know, ring blank that has like a little blank pad on it. Boop, and I just set that and it makes a beautiful ring. But I want to teach us, um, <clears throat> I want to teach everybody how to join these together in a very cute cool chain maily way that I like to do. So... If the other tutorials that we've done were level one half Persian three in one, I'm stepping it up to a level two. Oh, and so there you can see we've hooked through one, but now I'm going to need to bring that end up and over. And then close. And the more I do of this, the easier it gets. And bringing it around and so you can see this is how they're all kind of stacked and it just it's making that pattern and you can see it makes a nice little bit of a trough just right there that will hold around the edge of the stone now there are ways of doing the half Persian three in one bezel where you could incorporate more rings or extend it into a little bit of a half or a, a European four in one on the sides and not have to use glues and I've also done some uh, techniques where I'm utilizing wire to come in as like a hybrid piece to wire wrap around. Um, again, to be able to hold the cabochon without any glue or adhesive. But I find that those have particular looks to them. And sometimes I just want a very simple, sleek bezel. And that's why I use the UV resin, often to pretty good Pretty, pretty good results. So this one I'm gonna do to 18 links long. And the nice thing about this too is it's very replicable. Once you get this weave down, you can just churn it out all day long. And you can size up or size down the rings. It remains the same. So it's a very nice kind of, if I have a day where I want to be technically creative, but don't want to have to use my brain a whole lot, I just need to get some stuff made. Um, oop. And sometimes rings just break in half. As somebody who has coiled and cut my own rings, this is just a thing that happens sometimes. So I'll just scooch those off to the side. And then we're going to take another open one. And we're going to pick up, oh, it's kind of slippery. <laughs> there we go. And we just keep calm and weave on. Hooking through. And closing. Tucking behind. I'm doing this in real time with you because you never know how something might go sideways. And there's lots of folks who show the correct way of how to make something. Um, sometimes I learn more by messing up and figuring out, oh gosh, what happened? How do I fix it? So something that may be happening is you've put your ring on and it's looking like that. And it's just not correct. Like, sometimes it's hard to be able to put your finger on it, but it's like, it's, uh, you know, you, you'll know when you're weaving, you'll be like, uh-oh, I don't think that's right. What has happened here is I did not hook through the Venn diagram. Do you see how that ring, and I'm going to show you, I'm going to continue on for the sake of science. Okay, so that's the first indicator is I can't tuck this ring behind where it needs to be. So what happened here is this ring is not going through this one. It is on this side, but I needed it to be going through differently. So again, I'm going to find the closure of our ring. I'm going to open it up. 
and we're going to extract the ring that we had added. <clears throat> and so now, I'm going to open it up just a little wider. What had happened is I had hooked through and it didn't go through both. So let's tuck that ring into place because whenever we hook through, it's very, very important that we come through that side. So it's making sure that we're hooking through that little Venn diagram. So whereas here, it travels through the top of the ring, we really wanna make sure that we're coming in through the bottom of the ring. And the bottom is just the side that's towards me. And the top is the side that's away. So we're gonna close that. And now that leaves us the space to be able to tuck that behind. So that's a common mistake that uh, I've made in my own work, as well as I've seen in folks' work that they send pictures and they're like, help, what happened? It's coming in from below on both of the rings and then we don't re-enter it at all like you can see this end here can't even we might be able to if it were a slightly larger ring size like a slightly larger uh, aspect ratio which is just the proportions it's the proportions between the gauge of the wire and the inner diameter of the ring so hooking through the one and then coming and hooking through the bottom of that one. But if you are feeling frustrated, that is very, very valid. This can be a very frustrating weave. Sometimes it's okay to set down the project, walk away, pause the video, come back in a little bit with fresh eyes and try again. But, and this is where I do highly recommend, if this is your first time, again, um, to use one color of ring for your open rings and one color of ring for your closed rings, because that's really going to help dif differentiate when you're weaving. To Like, it just makes things a little clearer. Or can. All right, let's see. Let's see if we can count this. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven eight, nine, ten. Oh, oh, I blinked and lost track. Okay. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. So I don't know if I need this little guy hanging off the end or not. So I'm going to remove them. So this is how we want our ends before we start binding, uh, joining the ends. There are no loose, loosey-goosey, hanging off rings. I'm going to pick this up in the ring that is most protruding. So not this one, because it's got another ring over it, but this one, because it's the one closest to the end. I'm going to take it and I'm going to open it quite wide and I'm holding pretty close to the tip of the ring and then we're going to follow this we don't want any twists so I'm just following the ribbon of chainmail we've made around and I'm hooking through this ring here the one that it is also closest to the end and I'm just hooking through whoop dropped my ring which let's address if your ring has fallen out Oh no, now we have a floppy end again. It's okay. We just come through there. It's as though we're continuing to weave and then we're gonna hook this ring over and then coming around and the ring that's closest to the end. See, this is where if we had two tones of rings, you'd just hook through whichever ring is the same color as that ring right there. So again, just hooking through, boop, right there. And then we're gonna close it. And 
then I like to hold, and on smaller pieces like this, I can just use my fingers to fill the space. So this is the ring that we've just added. And so you can almost recognize in the pattern if this is how the ring, so there's a ring coming out of there and a ring coming out of there and a ring coming out of there. So this ring right here needs to be going through this ring right here. So if we have our pointy uppy rings, which are these ones along the top, and then our pointy downy rings, which are these ones on the bottom. This one's a pointy downy ring that needs hooked through this pointy uppy ring. Super technical terminology, by the way. <laughs> and again, I, I do hope that this is helpful to y'all. So I'm just scooching that ring around until I find its opening. And then I'm going to open it. And now I kind of turn a little funny here. But I'm angling this hand. Whoops. <laughs> Slipped off my pliers. I'm angling this hand towards me to bring that end more where it needs to be. And I'm using my fingernail to hold that ring in place and we want to stay hooked. Do you see how it came through right there? I know my fingers are gross. Please leave a comment. Thanks for the engagement. Um, <laughs> these are working hands y'all. Um, but yeah, so we wanted to stay inside this ring here and we wanted to just pop through Venn diagram style just right there. And I've fed through too much, so I'm just going to scooch that around. We're going to grab that end. And we're going to close it. And now we can take this. And we're going to roll it around. And we're going to test fit it. So this is pretty snug, but that's okay. We can kind of feed that in. Because we want it to be snug, but you can see, like, um, if it's too tight, some of your rings will start to spread open. And that is not desirable. We want our rings to stay nice and closed. And so if you've got any little pokey bits or anything like that, we can take these. <clears throat> One of my favorite things to do, especially whenever it's, uh, if some of the closures are very obvious. You know, they're as good as we can get them, but they're still just a little obvious. I'm grabbing with my pliers and kind of inching it around to get those. I don't want them lined up with the other rings while they're under pressure because if you get two openings that are lined up and they're a little loose, they'll slide off. So while the rings not un or while the rings are not under pressure, I'm just going to get those tucked around. It's just tucking in our loose ends. I didn't feel like going through and <laughs> TIG welding every single little spot. But you could totally do that if you wanted to use like copper or sterling silver you could solder or if you're into welding i've seen some for that uh permanent jewelry like the bracelets that you can put like a little bit of leather down and then like kind of spot weld just the little ring that joins it um you can do anything you want really so that is how we make a chainmail bezel and even though that is fit and just as snug as anything I still wouldn't trust it without an adhesive because it can be dislodged is that a word dislodged I think you know what I mean though it can be knocked out and so there's that one and now let's take a look at this one and that's still that's feeling it's a little loose, 
but it's tight enough that it'll stay on for me to do the adhesive because if I removed a whole ring, I do think it would be too tight for this one. So let's see how it looks. How does it look whenever we do one that's just too tight? You know, actually, I may go ahead and take one of the rings out because that's fitting pretty snug and nice too. Okay, <clears throat> so now that I've communicated my fear, let's go ahead and try it anyways because just because I'm worried about something doesn't mean that it's gonna like, that I shouldn't still experiment. So to, un to let's say you've made your, your bezel and it's too big or too small and you need to add more. So what we'll do is I'm just gonna turn it kind of inside out to where that trough side, where the flat side is poking out. Um, I'm gonna find my worst closure, so there it is. Just if one snags your finger or catches your eye, I just start there. I don't worry about what my first or last ring was. And I'm just getting my pliers in. And then I'm going to open that ring. and I'm going to just remove it entirely. And so now we can see there's this ring that only has this ring and that ring in it. I'm gonna open that one up. Boop. And then just pulling that off. And so now we've made this one segment shorter. So I'm gonna come in here, I'm gonna find the one that's closest to the end and I'm going to open it. I'm going to follow the ribbon of our chain mill around so there's no twists. And I'm going to hook it through, boop, right there. The one that's also closest to the end. And we're going to close it. And then this ring right here. Blah, 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 that one. <laughs> um, I'm just going to twist that around till we find the split in the ring and then I'm going to open it. And now I twist my hand towards me. I'm bringing it in and I use this fingernail to kind of push that ring over the end so it can come come up and through. Opening wider is better than opening more narrow on this one just because it gives you a little bit more I don't have to wrench my hand as far around and then we close it and what I mean by that is um, Whenever I'm weaving I bring my hand around this way and the wider my ring is the less what the less I have to wrench my hand around so I Hope that that makes sense so now let's see if this fits. Oh yeah, that's much better. In fact, I think that's perfect because I don't feel like there's an undue amount of stress on the rings. And even whenever there's a very slight variation in your cabochon size, these are only one ring off from each other. So if I were to able if I were able to make this one a little looser, I can balance out how the symmetry of the necklace is happening, even if I have irregularly shaped stones, because if I at both of them end up in a bezel that's the same size, like the same number of rings, then it's going to make it look the same. And let me count real quick. The way that I like to count whenever they're on. And I have such a hard time with this because whenever I look at things directly, they kind of like move around on me. I have to focus very hard, so bear with me. So one is the one that is covered by my thumbnail. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Eighteen on that one. Covering the one with my thumbnail. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. So, oh, <laughs> that one just popped right up out of his setting. So they aren't exactly the same size. So let's see if I can add one into this one and see if it's too loose. So again, just coming around here inside out, and. If y'all are 
you already know everything and this is boring to you, go ahead and set your other three stones. We will be doing that off camera. But for the rest of us who are trying to figure this out, we're going to keep going. And so I'm getting in there, just picking a ring, just a ring, and opening it, removing it, setting it down. There's the ring that's just one joining two together. And, and so now I'm going to add in this ring right here. This is taking the place of a ring that would have just been sitting loose anyways. So this is how to weave this if you're only doing one ring at a time. So that one comes and sits behind it. And then we're going to take this ring and it's going to hook through one and whoop, one and two. Whenever that happens, it's just because the ring got too close to the tip of the pliers and it slides off. It happens. Closing that one, taking this one, and we're going to hook through right there, which if you're having a really difficult time with the closed ring being on there and having to do it to where you cross over to where it's in the back, this may be the way to uh, bypass that. Because we're all different with the way we hold our hands and with the way we look at things, so just because this is how I like to weave it does not mean it's the best way of weaving it. You'll find your best way by weaving. So now I've hooked that through the little Venn diagram. They're stacked just as they need to be. And then I'm going to follow around here, making sure there's no twists in the bezel, and we're just going to hook that on. The ring that was closest to the other end. And now from here, this bottom ring, whoop, I want to make sure that it's getting placed in on top of there. So you may need to poke some things around to get it to lay where it needs to be for the pattern. Uh, squishing and smushing and poking and prodding is what makes it a, more of an art than a science. But <laughs> So we're going to open that nice and wide and then we're going to come in here and we're going to hook through a fed. We're going to hook through. There we go. And again, just pressing until it comes up. I use my fingernails a lot in weaving, especially on these smaller bezels. And we're going to bring those ends together. We're going to turn it inside out. And we're going to see if this fits. You know, and it's a little loose, but now our bezels are the same size. And this is how I like to make pieces look as symmetrical as possible, even when I have irregularly shaped cabochons. And you could do this with tumbled stuff, like it just helps make a, especially if it's for earrings or for necklaces, like how this one is going to be, it helps it to look a lot more balanced. So even though we had a little bit of variation between those two glass cabochons by doing the same number of rings in the bezel, it gives the illusion of symmetry. So now we're going to do that same thing on these ones here. One of the things that we get a lot of questions about over the years regarding the half Persian three in one is how do we know how many, you know, links long to make our bezel? So, and I don't have a good answer for that. It's truly experience, um, but and just trial and error. And what I mean by that is, you know, sometimes all the experience you need is to have one woven that is a size that you know that it, like this is 20 uh, units or segments long. And so I'm going to put it on this one and it's like, you know, that's not quite big enough. Let's try 22, 23, 21. I don't know. Let's try it out and see. And so here I have 20 segments that we've woven off screen and I'm going to put on 21 and close it. I'm not really going to worry about the loose end right now because I just want to hold it up and see. That's not quite closing the gap, so let's try 22. Okay. 
And so we've put on another ring, letting the loose end just kind of dangle, and we're coming in. And, you know, it looks like 22 might do it because that loose ring's kind of sitting butted up against. And so let's check this one. Mm, 22 is going to be pretty tight on that one, but it might be a good, I don't know, we're just going to have to try it and see. So now I'm going to take one ring that's open with no closed on it, and I'm going to hook it through. And that one's still just open. So how earlier we would have closed this and sat it on the table and looked at it to see how the ends were, well, we can skip that step because we've just added this. If we were to close it, we'd need to open it immediately again just to close the weave. So we're going to bring that end around. And coming through here, I'm just going to hook right there. Sound effects can be helpful. And close it. And then you can see here this ring. I'm just pushing it up. That way it sits in line with all the other ones on the pokey downy bit. And I'm going to find the opening. There we go. And what I'm doing is I'm just grabbing it with my pliers and scooching it around just to find where that opening is. And then we're going to open it. And just as we have before, hook through. And I want to make sure that whenever I hook through, it's not coming out of this ring on the back, because sometimes that can happen, and that's okay. If it were easy, all of us would be doing great. <laughs> but ooh, sometimes the, uh, the joy is in the struggle. So now that this is pinged across the desk, we get to try to find which ring it was we were working on, because I did not close it all the way. Or maybe I did. I don't know. Maybe it's on the other side. This is a great opportunity to just check on all my closures anyhow. Sometimes overbending is necessary. Well, I seem to have lost my loose end. I guess it got closed well enough, but now we can test it out. It's a little loose on that one, just by a smidge. And what I mean by that is I could, it held on through a drop test, so that should be tight enough for me to be able to do the back. I hear a train, um, but let's try on this one. So is that 22? Seems to be just right, and it fits very well on that one too. So that's how I trial and error getting these on, is it's just, I don't know, let's try one more. Um, so uh, now through the magic of editing. So I'm on our last bezel, and I thought I was just going to breeze through this, but I did need, I think, about 10 more rings. So I wanted to show you, in case you were curious, how I set up my units. <clears throat> my husband's much tidier at rows than I am, but we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, and then seven, eight, nine and ten. I like to set up on a work surface that we can scooch off to the side because sometimes I just spaz out and drop my pliers or something slips and I'd rather all of our hard work not to be directly in my line of fire. Um, so that's why I work on a work surface. And then I'm going to come through and I'm going to close the ring and then I just set it on there. Now, um, something that I think might be useful to know, um, something I wish I had known, uh, is I don't mix 
rings. Whenever I get this size of ring, especially whenever it's small rings like this and it's hard to sort them, um, I do not mix rings from manufacturers. So even if it's the exact same metal type, a inner diameter and wire gauge, um, and sometimes even ordering from manufacturers batch to batch, um, I try to not mix rings because, whoop, there's a broken one, because sometimes you'll get slight variation uh, in the ring sizes. And while they would work together with themselves perfectly, it doesn't always work out um, mixing them. So if there's even just a, you know, a millimeter in size difference makes a huge difference in whether or not rings will behave well with each other. So just, it's kind of like you with yarn dye batches. Um, I try to work on a project and have it be all from the same ring batch if I can help it or to at least test it a bit first before mixing bags from different manufacturers because sometimes um, sometimes there's just a little bit of variation and that's good to be mindful of. It's not a problem until it is. And so now I'm coming through and I'm gonna leave this last one empty because typically if I know that like like this one, I knew we needed 22 or however many. Um, I'd set up all 22. I'd put two on the first and none on the last. And that just makes joining them easier for me. So now through the magic of editing. You could at this point go ahead and do either a two-part epoxy on the back or my recommended route is the UV resin because this stuff is pretty affordable and if you can't get your hands on a UV lamp just wait for a sunny day. It's less convenient but I find it is actually more effective because the sun don't mess around. Like it's cloudy sometimes but even then <laughs> I've had a cloudy day work better than a cheap UV lamp but that's just my experience. Like whenever I cure in the sunshine I don't have any trouble with tackiness or anything like that so but uh, that's again just my experience but you could go ahead and do the backs right now sometimes the risk in that I find is if I do too much the little holes in the edge of our bezel can get filled in with resin so I prefer to do this step and then and then seal the backs so I just have for each of the connection points like let's say on this necklace I want to do where it connects to the rest of the chain where they connect together and then to each other again and then a teardrop. So for each of those individual connection points I'm going to want two open rings in at least the same ring size as what we used to weave the bezel. You could use larger rings but they'll protrude a little bit. I have not had a lot of success with using smaller rings unless I'm just hooking the back of the bezel. So we could go through both the front and the back and I'm just picking like a random spot because again it doesn't matter as much because my thing's not glued in. But I've hooked through the front as well as the back. And you can see how that'd be pretty tricky if we were using a smaller ring size. But since we're using the same ring size, and I do like to turn that to where our closure is pointed towards the inside. So that's how that looks. And I like to do two rings just to make it a little bit more robust. So I'm just going to pick one side or the other, doesn't really matter. Hook it through and close it. Now if we had already glued the bezel it would matter a lot more because I'd want to you know make sure that they're distributed evenly around the stone either being perfectly side to side or what have you but since it's like this we can just take our stone out or a on or I know it's glass but and just position it however we like. So that's it hooking through both sides. And now I'm going to show you hooking through just the back, which I think gets a pretty cool effect. Like, I think it's pretty. So hooking through just that back ring. 
and then closing and then we're going to add a second one and this one I don't mind doing with smaller jump rings if necessary so this gives it I mean those are just two different looks neither is right or wrong it's just whichever you prefer I kind of like the unobstructed front of the bezel here on this one but this holds together really nicely this also gives a little bit more room and movement inside the rings so I think I'm going to go with this route today so we're just gonna as careful as we were to tuck our ends it's always good to be in good habits because you know even if we have to undo it we still practiced the habit of tucking the opening in just because it's one less thing to have to worry about down the road and then opening that up now let's say you already had set your stones or your cabochons with the UV resin and so from here we'd want to decide do I want that to be perfectly in line or do I want it to be offset just a little bit and I think I want this to be offset just a little bit because of the way that I'd like for it to sit on the neckline and that's a designer's choice there's no right or wrong I mean, if you're designing for a client, you can ask them if they'd prefer for it to sit straight across the neck like a choker, or if they'd rather it sit on their collarbones. Or So if this were to be like a 36 inch long necklace or something, I would do them, you know, so that it'll be here. Whereas if it were a choker, I'd have it designed to where it would sit there. You know, so you can really control the distance between them as well as the angle that they interact with each other at. Okay, <clears throat> so now again for the sake of symmetry we're going to count, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight empty rings between those two connection points. So I'm just going to pop these on on this side. There's one. And then there's two. And then orient your cab however you would like it to be. And then we're going to count. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight full on nakey spots. No rings in them. Before I hook through the back and close. So we can double check. And I'm going to look from the back this time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And it's on the ninth ring that we've hooked that on. And then we're going to attach another below it this time because I'm trying to maintain that spacing. And so let's see, is it any different on the other side? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten full on Nike rings. So there's those. And now we're going to hook through, and I'm going to have these ones on the end just be a little bit perfectly even if I can. So there's one, two, and so let's look at, I'm just going to get another ring in hand, that way I'm ready when I'm counting. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. 14, 15, 16, 17. Hmm. Okay, so it's going to have to be a little offset. So let's do seven rings. Because my math on that is we've got 17. Subtract two for the space that the rings will take up. And that's 14. No, that's 15. Split in half, so we'll have seven on one side and eight on the other. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Really hope that that made sense at all. And then hooking through. 
And so we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Close enough. I'm going to put the longer end towards the bottom. And then we're just going to hook through. There's one. And there's two. Whoop! <laughs> Let's get that cabs snuck back in there. Making sure that I'm maintaining, because there's not really a front or a back or a top or a down to this until we've established it with ring placement. And then we're gonna go, let's get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then full womp, going through there. And then we're gonna pick up another ring, and we're gonna hook through right here, just down below it, trying to maintain that seven empty rings. Because then, whoop, sorry, loud noises then everything else will kind of fall into line. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven here on the top, and we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight naked rings there on the bottom. And now we're gonna do our big guy in the middle. <clears throat> so from here, let's establish, I do like it wide, so I'm gonna hook through just here for the whoop. Well, we can do this without the stone in too if your stone likes to hop out. So we're just hooking through one ring, deciding which side the back is. So there's one. And then I'm going to come right next to it and hook through just one ring. It's a little trickier this way, so you could just use your finger as a stand-in for the cab to get it to open up. Man, I'm having a heck of a time. That's okay. There we go. But yeah, with crafting, the obstacle is the way. If the stone keeps jumping out, try adding the stuff without the stone in there. And then we can kind of get it positioned in. And from here, I just want to make sure that this is where the teardrop's going to be coming out. So I want to count and have the shoulder bits where it's going to be attaching to the rest of the necklace uh, be the same distance. I'm not worried about this many rings, I'm worried about this many rings on the side. So let's count from our established center point. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Let's hook through on the tenth. No, on the ninth. Okay, whoop. That's okay. And then before adding the second one, I'm going to count nine empty. So wait, what did I just do? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight empty on the ninth. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So right there's where we're wanting to hook through. Oop. Well, I'm just going to throw it on into my lap. But that's all right. We got it. I think. Did we? I don't know. It's stuck. Okay, we're gonna recount that one. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and there on the ninth ring, we're hooking through. Okay. And the reason I've done it like this is I can look at it and I can be like, well, if I wanted it to be a little higher, I can add the second ring up high. If I've decided I want it to be a little lower, I can add the second ring down low. 
and I think I'd like it to be up high. Exploring the options and the variations and finding our own personal preferences in how to do a design is one of the fun parts, I think. It's not all just it's not all just throwing stuff. <laughs> but it's figuring out what we as the artisan prefer because that's kind of, you know, getting to make it exactly like how you want is part of the fun. Even if it's not pleasing to anybody else's eye, if you like it, you've done it right. Though on that same subject, I've made bunches of stuff that I don't particularly care for, but that other people totally loved. So just because you don't like it doesn't mean it, that it's not, you know, right. So <laughs> it's very liberating, but it also gets into like chaos land. So there we are. And now we get to start going hog wild because we could do, let's see, we could take little bead links in whatever variety or style and use those to attach together so that's definitely super cute you could use like faceted ring faceted uh, beads or you could use coin beads or you could use you could make little mobius flowers out of other chainmail rings and now that gets tricky because I'd need to put more rings on the side here to make it be where they could join together nicely just because these rings are too many to fit in there so stay tuned and we may do a tutorial on using the mobius flowers to join because i do think that that is very pretty i like the balance and contrast between the density of the glass baubles and the beautiful Mobius flowers. We could just use a very large open ring to connect. And I find this to be a whole lot of fun, especially if I want to be draping chain in between. So let's say on this one, so I just hooked through those sections that we've just added and that's our nice connection point but let's say um, perhaps in addition to or in place of having a little teardrop hanging down here if we had these rings on either side we could be joining little drapes of chain and that gives us a lot of space to be able to attach that chain to come down and then we can do chain in between again and then possibly even again which I think makes a super cute belt style though whenever I do this as a belt I try to make sure to that you don't want the pressure to be applied towards the ends and I'll demonstrate this um, I don't know if that makes sense I don't want pressure to be pulling quite hard on this um, because and I'll show you what happens whenever too much end pressure gets applied to this uh, style it'll start spitting cabs So these are a 16 gauge, let's see, these are a 16 gauge 3 8 inch ring that I'm using to join together. And then we could reduce it down to, I don't have them on my desk. Wait, I've got them right here. This is a 16 gauge. Let me show you on the chart. These are a 16 gauge 5 sixteenths. If you pretend like it's closed, it lines up. Um, so yeah, there's the whatever it is in millimeters. So 1.6 millimeter, 7.9 millimeter. 
if ever I list something and it's, I say, millimeters or centimeters in place, like, please extrapolate. <laughs> if uh, I say, oh, well, this is 40 centimeters, and it's very clearly not 40 centimeters. Uh, I probably meant millimeters. <laughs> so... <clears throat> So hooking through, and we're going to close that. And I bet you can visualize if we used larger or smaller or square cut or square shaped or just whatever we decide to put in between these stone, these uh, baubles that we've made set in chain mail can really affect the whole look of the piece. I personally really, really like this. But yeah, just to show you, if we pull real hard on the ends, they just pop right out. Now if we fill in the back with UV resin, that can help quite a bit, but we still run into this situation where uh, at some point the rings are either going to give out or the UV resin is going to give out. And we're still going to end up with popped rings. Oops. So whenever I do that, oftentimes uh, for it being a belt, I'll I'll go through and put like a big big ring or something around this, um, or back it with leather, or just get creative and try to find a way to be able to <clears throat> reinforce this so that it can be utilized as a belt without running into that structural popping out of the cabochons that can tend to happen. I don't run into it nearly as much with necklaces, um, but yeah, if, so if I were to do this as a belt, I would probably just um, perhaps do a thin leather band or another band of European 4-in-1 chain mail. Um, that I would then attach these things to, that way that band would be taking the stress of being worn. Okay, and then I'm going to use these rings from this Mobius flower here. These are 16 gauge 1 fourth inch rings. And this is standard wire gauge. And I love, love, love using slightly gradiated rings. So from that large to small, I think it, oh, oh, I just love it. <laughs> so, mm -mm -mm. So there we have all of that. And let's see, do we have anything over here that would make a cute little dangly down? We do. So I make some, sorry, I'm getting weird. Um, we make some of our own uh, lamp work glass. If you all have been are new to the channel, you might not have known that. If you, um, It's a relatively newer addition, but I've started making some of these very cool little teardrops where we use a marine grade stainless steel that doesn't melt in the torch. And then we just put a little glob of glass on there. And I think I'm gonna use, I don't know if I'm gonna use this one or if I'm gonna use that one. I'm going to use this one. Kind of like, kind of like this one best. So hopefully that'll be something that I might be able to start listing into the shop uh, at first as individuals and then or like as singles and then if I can get better at making them be matching pairs we might do matching pairs because I'd be so cute for earrings. Or you could use like a ball pin or a head pin or something and get that all connected in that way. Um, but I'm going to use, because I have to be careful with these because I don't want to crack the glass and any sort of stress that I put on the wire can sometimes translate into the glass cracking. But I'm going to use this third to hook through there and to hook through right here. And you could hang a charm. You could hang really just whatever you like. 
Ooh, now I don't actually know if I like it with that ring coming off the bottom. So let's try then. And again, it might have been your favorite way, but you can do it the way that you want in your pieces. And I think that's the beauty of getting to make things. So I'm going to open that up and I'm going to hook through. Whoop, that's okay. At this point, it's not glued in, so that's more or less supposed to happen. <laughs> You know, I bet we could make some really cool looking chain mail even without the bezels, you guys. Like, or even without the cabs. Just uh, playing with making netting and different shapes and things with the chain mail all by its own self. So that's pretty neat. But yeah, so now that we have everything situated, the way that I would recommend gluing this in and that's uh well it's still pretty cloudy and windy outside so I'm gonna go dig out my UV lamp okay so whether I were doing this with a UV lamp or whether I were just doing this and sticking it out in the sunshine the technique remains more or less the same so I'm going to start I'm going to do one UV resin it or like a UV light it do the next UV light it and so you hopefully you'll be able to see here and I'm just getting it to where it touches the edge with that surface tension of the UV resin I want it globbed all the way around but I do not want it to be dripping and then putting the light over it So there you can see hopefully I and mean, this did have like a little bottom but it got all messy so I'm just gonna have it here and there I guess like I don't know I, I don't have a whole lot of faith in my lamp using abilities so it's been like a questionable amount of time like more than a minute less than five and I'm gonna poke it ah still a little sticky but we can totally flip it over and see and we did get a little bit of puddling around in the front but that's okay we may just want to try to be consistent or we could scrape it off if you gooby it up you can totally just pop the whole cab out and uh, peel off the UV resin <laughs> and just try to go again but yeah so you can totally see here we got a little bit filled in there and it's things that I mean you may never notice unless the artist is pointing it out but yeah so we've got that in there a little bit of stickiness going on on the back but I don't want to goop it up too much with fingerprints so I'm just gonna pop that back in there let it cure up and proceed from there I guess um, so again my preferred method is using the sunshine because it is so fast so effective and I get to be outside so less worry about fumes and things um, I probably look a little deranged to my neighbors because I'm just you know standing in my front yard holding stuff up towards the sky uh, but you know it's a good conversation starter <laughs> So it also, it occurs to me that I'm coming at this like a complete barbarian. Um, I remember the instructions that my friend had originally given me was to do just a small whoop, on the edges. Let's get that UV lamp on it and then we can fill in the back and that way it has less uh, liquid pushing on it and like seeking out where gravity's drawing it to, um, making just a little bit of a barrier so that may get us better results. So you don't have to go through and just barbarian bash your way through the whole project, even though that is my favorite, but uh, we can pretend like we are civilized crafters and do it in two steps. <laughs> and uh, 
yeah so there's there's always <laughs> the obstacle is the way it's like oh no i put too much in and it overflows well let's try putting less in so let's see yeah and so now we have a new leakage around to the front we can and i'm going to go ahead and do just that little bit on all of these that way they stop popping out because that makes me wild y'all like it's good to practice being patient but it's even better i think to reduce the amount of friction in a project so i'm not having my patience be tried so frequently they're just my thoughts on it so and i'm just using the tip of the applicator seems to be doing a good enough job Whoop. let's put it back on Ooh, technology. So there we are. I haven't filled in the full backs yet because I am going to do that when the sun shines out that way. I mean, this one isn't sticky anymore though, but just to get on with the project. And so from here, we have a lot of different options for how we would like to bind off our necklace. We could use beading cable and do strung beads. We could do more chain mail. We could just do probably one of my favorites for just nice and easy <laughs> is this is enameled iron chain from the ringlord.com. I really like it. This is their 20 gauge platinum plated uh, and I think it's a really nice like it holds up it's nice and dainty you can fold it over and use two lengths of it if you want it to be a little bit more robust but I'm just going to attach let's see how long is this bum, 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 bum. fancy ruler activated So this is at around seven inches and I usually like to make our necklaces when we're making them for sale just in our booth or on our website. I make them a base length of 18 inches with a few inches of extender chain which is the, uh, the size larger. There's a 19 gauge um, of the same platinum toned and you know plated iron wire. Um, from the ringlord.com and that's what I like to use as the extender chain So and I'm actually going to take a ring of that and we're going to go ahead and attach the clasp So I'm going to do Where's my clasps? Oh, I'd set a spool of wire on top of them. These are stainless steel clasps that I get on Amazon. They are linked down in the video description below. And that is in an affiliate link. So if you purchase through it, it can help to benefit and uh, throw some money back to the our company without any additional cost to you. So we do earn a small, very small commission on some of the links down below in the video description. But truly they're there to help y'all get started shopping. So if you just don't know what a, what you'd like to get or where to start that's a good spot to start but you may be able to find something that's more affordable or that's more suited to your style and i just use wire snips to cut this those are linked down below as well let's see i'm gonna give it just a little longer there we go so just measuring off boop, and boop. trimming that right off the spool and I like the the 20 gauge that we're using here because I can just open up this big old ring and I can hook through like it, it, it is accommodating to it in its inner diameter which I think makes a really nice, seamless, strong join. I mean, strong enough. I don't like flimsy little jump rings, but this isn't welded chain. It is just butted links. Uh, so that's only going to be so strong. 
but it's still it's nice to know that there is a good breaking point in the necklace because it's very easy to repair this chain but if like uh, if you're wearing it and a handbag gets tangled in it or something as you're putting it over your shoulder it, it is nice to have your necklace go ahead and break that way you're not getting choked out by your handbag and your necklace wrestling you um there's Existing is hazardous, you guys. So if I can have this designed where it's most likely to break, like I call it the break zone, um, then that's an easy repair. Whereas if this were like, let's say we did strung beads, I'd want the break point to be up by the clasp. That way I don't have to risk restringing all the beads. So I try to have there be an intentionally weaker link than everywhere else in the necklace. That way you know, if it breaks, it's an easy fix as opposed to, you know, it'll hold and hold and hold until one of the cabs pop out and then the cab might break or it's a, it's a harder repair. Um, so that's just from, I, I design it not to break, but if it's going to, I'd like it to not be a complete disaster. And then you can just hook it anywhere along the neckline or along that extender chain. And I just think that's the prettiest necklace I've made all morning. <laughs> So now from here, now that I've decided I like it, I'm going to go ahead and fill in the rest of the box. Still bringing it up to the edge just a bit. Because this UV resin does tend to shrink just a little when it's curing. You know, and this is making me nervous. I should have still just done one and then the next and then the next, but I do like to push the limits of what projects will tolerate because I'd rather me experiment and you learn. That way I've only wasted my time, effort, energy, and materials, but you'll know what to do. And I'm going to leave that there to cure for like, I don't know, like anywhere from five to 30 minutes. So the sun did pop out and I was able to go outside and catch some rays on the front and back and all around the sides of this necklace just to make sure that there's no stickiness or anything and it's full on cured and, uh, and the, the sun really does the trick. So that is how to make this necklace, you guys. And you can very easily change this up a little bit if you wanted to use um, different sizes. Oh my gosh, this would actually be a perfect, if instead of a little teardrop, we did like perhaps a medium and small coming down to a ring as well. That would be a beautiful hand flower style bracelet. Um, it just you could turn it into anklets, armbands, whatever you want. If there's an appendage, you can put this on it. Well, oh my God, as a headband too, y'all. Okay, so <clears throat> this is how to make that necklace. I do hope that this was helpful to you. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas, please do leave them down below. I love hearing from you guys. I know I say that in like every video, but that's because it's true. I love hearing from you guys. I have learned so much from y'all over the years. So thank you to everybody who's been hanging in there with us. Hello and welcome, and thank you to all of the new folks who are here watching this. Um, and we do new tutorials and live streams all the time. So check out our website, backtoearthcreations.com with, if you would like to see our schedule of events and see when you can expect to see us online or in person, as well as to get your hands on some beautiful, if I say so myself, handmade cabochons. We also carry other gemstones and different things that we can get our hands on in our travels. So be sure to go over there and check that out. Um, craft along club, all that other stuff, links about that are down in the video description and thank you guys so much again for being here I hope that it was helpful um, or got your creative juices flowing or something and I will see y'all next time so until then you guys happy crafting Mwah! bye <laughs>